Thank you, Tara. Hi. Remember when you were a kid? Well, part of you still is. And Fago remembers, and so does the Fago book. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, before I get started, we need some ground rules. There's somebody here from Toledo. So we need to have some Detroit and Michigan ground rules. The first ground rule is we're all here because we love or are curious about Fago, right? Uh, the next ground rule is we're all here because we love Detroit. And the third ground rule, what do we call that stuff? Thank you. For the next hour, we're going to call it pop exclusively. Thank you. We're not going to call it soda. We're not going to call it carbonated beverages. We're not going to call it tonic. And we are especially not going to call it Cokes. An hour from now, you can resume your old ways. Before I ever give this talk, I have to thank this lady here. This is Susie Faginson. Isn't she pretty? This is Susie Faginson, who made the book possible. I went to Fago and I said, I would like to do a book about Fago, and they were not interested. So I crabbed about it for about four years, and I was crabbing to my students at, sorry, Michigan State University, and um, one of them said, do you know Susie Faginson? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, Susie Faginson, my high school English teacher, a member of the Fago family. And I said, well, do you have your high school English teacher's contact information? Stupid question. Of course he did. So he gave me her email, and I emailed her, and she ignored my first and maybe my second email, and then we started talking, and I started to ask her about the family's version of the Fago story. So she made this happen, and uh, thank you, Susie. This is a picture of Susie in her garage. The light was nice in there, with a big, giant, red pop clock that she keeps in the garage because it's too big to go into the house. So. Uh, I want to start with the Red Pop chapter. I did all the chapters by flavors. And the Red Pop chapter is about how much we love Fago. We love Fago so much that we invite it to our weddings. This delicious looking double cheeseburger is not a double cheeseburger, it is a wedding cake. And that can of Fago pop over there is not a can of pop. And that Coney dog is not a Coney dog, and I bet those sandwiches and better made chips are not what they look like either. Uh, right now there's, a, there's a, a, a Coney book going around the auditorium over there, Coney Detroit. Uh, that's the book that made me so thirsty I had to do the Fago book, and there's a copy of the Fago book there. It's going around. Uh, some people like to read something if there's a boring talk going on, and some people just put it over their face and go right to sleep. So we love Fago so much that we bake it into other things. Uh, we bake it into candles. Have you seen these candles? If you do, I just want to give you a little health advice. Do not drink the candles. <laughs> they smell like Fago, but they don't go down the same way. We bake it into bicycles. Detroit bikes made grape, orange, Arctic sun, red pop, and a moon mist bicycle in Fago colors. We bake it into rock and rye ice cream. We bake Fago into cupcakes. And in a second, you're, well, a minute, you're going to find out why that's notable. You might say we love Fago so much that it, in some cases it becomes part of us, like this guy. Um, yeah, his name is Slacker. Because I couldn't get any help from the Fago company, I had to go to different places to try to find the artwork. And that included places like eBay, Flickr, Instagram, uh, and sites like that. And I found, I think I found this one on, um, I think I found that one on Instagram. And I asked Slacker, when I figured out how to contact him, if I could use that picture. And was that in fact his arm? And he said yes and yes. So, we're going to take our story from before Fago began. We're going to go all the way back to 1905 in Detroit. Here it is, 1905. That's the old city hall. Uh, this right over here is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument downtown, now relocated slightly, so you know you're kind of at Zero Mile Road in downtown Detroit, in 1905. In 1905, uh, a Russian Jew named Perry Faginson dropped in on Detroit. 
here he comes. <laughs> and he had moved here from, not Toledo, but Cleveland, Ohio, where his family was. He moved up to Detroit and he started a business. Now, at the time, 1905, Detroit was booming. It was one of the, fa I think, the fastest growing city in the world. From 1900 to 1920, Detroit's population tripled. And in fact, the population of Detroit in 1920 was larger than it is today. That's how fast and how big it was growing. So Perry got here. He's a Russian Jew. He's an immigrant. His alphabet is not our alphabet. His name is kind of long, Faginson. He has an accent. A lot of times, you have to hire yourself when you're an immigrant. You have to start a company and feed other people. He moved into the Jewish enclave in Detroit, normal, and he opened a bakery. And almost immediately, he hated it. Now, why would a baker hate his work? Come on, people. The hours are awful. You have to get up about 4 in the morning, and he hated getting up early. So Perry sent for his little brother Ben, also in Cleveland, working for a pop company called Miller Becker. He said, Ben, come on up to Detroit. Let's go into business together. So, and this is a little bit of guesswork, Ben showed up like a puppy and said, okay, Perry, are we going to bake? And Perry said, no, we're done with baking. We're going to make pop. And Ben said, well, okay. Well, Perry said, you know how to make pop now, right? And Ben said, well, yeah, I do, but Perry, I don't have any recipes. Perry said, that's okay. I've got all these frosting recipes. We're going to use them to make pop. So the Faginson brothers started Fago in November of 1907 with frosting recipes. Their first three flavors were grape, fruit punch, and strawberry, which we call very good. This is a smart group. <laughs> I didn't have any doubts. So they, now, this was a terrible time to start a business. 1907, they started around November 7th. A worldwide depression started in October, and it lasted for years. It swept the world. It started in New York with speculators. So they're starting a new business during a big recession. The other problem with pop then was people thought you would only drink pop in the summertime. You didn't drink it in the winter. So the Faginson brothers, maybe it's because they were immigrants, I don't know, they started a pop company at the wrong time of year. They started in November. So in the first few months, they were going down to the river with other bakers' bread, selling it to people who would take it across the river to Canada, and they'd come up from the river with fish to sell in town. Remember, in 1907, the tunnel and the bridge hadn't been built. Those came in 1929 and 1930, so everything's going back and forth on a ferry. And the Faginson boys are trying to keep their business going. There's another problem with the business. When they sold pop, they sold it for three cents a bottle, eight ounces, two for a nickel. Three cents a bottle, but it costs like five to ten cents to make a bottle. So I'm giving you maybe 10, 12 cents worth of product for three cents. You don't have to be a math whiz to know that if you do that for very long, you're going to go out of business. So they had to get the bottles back all the time. In fact, in those days, this was the problem all bottlers faced. In those days, in some places, it was against the law. It was a crime to sell bottles to a different bottler. That means there must have been a market for stolen bottles. So think about that for a minute. There was another problem with pop. Pop, in 1907, when they started, was very perishable. For the bubbles to stay in pop, the water has to be super clean. Not just clean to look at, it has to be scrubbed clean because any little invisible particles will make the pop go flat. The other problem with pop in those days was the way they capped it. It let the bubbles out, and so they would have to spend one day making pop, the next day delivering it, and then the third day making more pop, and then the next day doing more deliveries. I got so confused. But they made it, and because the city's population was growing so fast, before too long, they had one of these. Ah, to help with their deliveries. And there, that guy on the wagon, of course, that's Perry. He looks pretty happy now that he's not a baker, doesn't he? <laughs> See that big smile? Perry said these horses were very smart. Now, their first, their first cart was a one horsepower model. This was the second generation. He said these horses were very smart. You just loaded up the wagon with the pop. You walk down the sidewalk. 
the horses clopped down the street, and when you came to a saloon, the horses stopped. You took off a case, you took it into the saloon, you brought out those empties because you had to refill them, right? You had to clean and refill them. And then you would walk to the next saloon, and the horses would stop at that saloon too, and then you could uh, make another delivery. So it was very smart and it was very convenient, except if maybe you were going to temple or you were going shopping, because the horses continued to stop at every saloon, no matter where they were going. So you had to budget a little bit of extra time. So um, recession, expensive bottles, wrong season, perishable pop, yet they can afford this nice rig because Detroit's population was booming. Why was it booming? Oh. The auto industry, right, especially Henry Ford. Now, this is interesting. These signs, that one and that one and this one over here, these came out of the Paquette uh, plant. Uh, they weren't there at the beginning. They were in pop machines later. But they came out of the Paquette. There's some guys restoring that plant and they were going through the closets and they found these three signs and one of them said, ah, more junk for the dumpster. But there was a guy there who said, oh, wait a minute, I know a guy who would probably like those signs. So he sent me a picture. He said, do you want these signs? I said, oh, yeah. What do you want, money? You want to trade? What do you want? He said, just meet me in a parking lot. I'll give them to you. So that's where these signs came from. Uh, the Model T was built, for, the first one was built in that plant. Most of them were built in this great big plant in Highland Park. This is what's going on. And in 1914, as you know, Henry Ford raised the wages to $5 a day. This literally made headlines all around the world. Egypt, all over Europe, South America. People flooded Detroit to get that $5 wage and that eight-hour workday. He shortened the workdays the same time he raised the wages. So I like this picture because everybody has a hat on. They're also all guys, I noticed. But at least the hats are different, right? Anyway. What street is on this one? This runs down the side. Woodward is like over where I am, a little bit more over. I don't know what the side street is called. I'll have to check. Come back next week. I'll be here. Uh, with that and other answers, too. <laughs> so um, he's selling pop like crazy. The Fagansons, I mean, he's selling cars. The Fagansons are selling pop like crazy. And they're doing so well with the pop, in fact, that pretty soon they stopped buying hay. They started buying gasoline because they had a nice new one of these made by General Motors, <laughs> GMC. And that happy guy on the front, who's that? Perry. He looks pretty happy. I don't know if Ben is in the picture, but I bet he is. But I don't know for certain. But that's definitely Perry. We can tell by the trademark ear-to-ear -ear grin. So they're driving around in this. Now you'd think, now Henry Ford might be mad that they bought a GMC, but at the same time Perry said he bought a Model T for himself from Ford. Um, Henry Ford had no problem telling people how to live. He told immigrants how to eat, how many vegetables, how much meat, what kind of meat, how to dress their children, how to take care of their children's hygiene. Um, he wanted to control every aspect of their lives, not just during those eight hours, but 24 hours a day. And Henry Ford had a special name for pop. He did not call it pop. He did not call it tonic or cokes. He called it belly wash. And he didn't want any of his men drinking that belly wash on lunchtime. So when lunchtime came, he had the gates to the plant closed. Across the street was a big pop stand. This was where the Fagansons and other bottlers were trying to sell pop. Well, Henry Ford wouldn't let the men get to the pop stand because he thought it was bad for them. Imagine that. I don't know where he gets such crazy ideas. So there were so many people on the outside waiting to get employed on the inside that the Fagansons continued to sell a lot of pop in saloons and at these pop stands, which looked a lot like newsstands. We've seen a lot of pictures of those. We haven't seen that many pictures of pop stands, but that's where they were using. The Fagansons did so well, they did so well, that by 1920, they were crowded out of the place where they were making the pop. They started by making it with a wash tub. This sounds appetizing, a wash tub. Pots and pans, not as nice as the ones we have at home. 
uh, a rubber hose for filling, and a thing for putting the caps on. And they were doing this in the house where they lived until they crowded themselves out of their own house, and then the whole house was filled with factory, and then they finally broke down and said, we have to build a factory. So they built a brand new factory in 1920. It was modern, it was efficient, it was cutting edge, it was state of the art. Do you want to see it? Of course we do. So far, everybody's wanted to see it. Here it is. Isn't that nice? The modern factory, 1920. And look at that smile. <laughs> He's so happy to be there. He could bite somebody. So in this factory, they could bottle, without handling, 75,000 bottles of pop in one day. Yep. And they got up to eight flavors. Now, in 1920, or close to when this factory opened, judging from newspaper ads, I found an ad in the Jewish News, they also changed the name of the company from Faginson Brothers Bottling Works. Now, I thought, tell me what you think, I thought a good name for their company might have been Ben and Perry's. <laughs> think that would have worked? But what they did was they shortened Faginson, that long, unwieldy Jewish name, down to Fago. And they said it fit so much better onto those little bottles they were using. Let me show you another picture from inside the factory. It's so cool. Oh, boy. This is a later factory. Sorry. We'll get around to it. This is a factory that opened in uh, 1935. But let me, let me give you the, uh, the neighborhood. So we're, here we are in Detroit. Here's the bakery. This grape circle uh, is where the bakery was. It was down on St. Antoine, and it was in the Jewish enclave. It lasted two years until Ben got there, and then they moved over one block and up six streets to a place on Hastings. Uh, that's where they opened in 1907. That's where they stayed till 1920. Now, you might have heard of the name Hastings. What was Hastings? Right. Hastings was the main street in historic Black Bottom. It ran down there. So this road up here is Gratiot, and this one over here is Woodward. So they're on the near east side, and they're just, the Jewish enclave is just up Hastings from where the black neighborhood was starting to build. Not in 1907, but pretty soon. So the factory began... Um, at the other end of what was uh, Paradise Valley. Now, we put this map together with 375 on here because what happened later was 375 came right down Hastings, wiped out the first two Fago factories, and it took out the, uh, the, the heart of the Black Bottom neighborhood. Black Bottom was called that because the soil there was river bottom soil. It was black and rich and good to grow in. Um, people get confused about that because that area, that green, what is that? Is that a rhombus or something? That shape. <laughs> that green area, that neighborhood, was the only place black people could live in Detroit. If you owned a house outside of that neighborhood and tried to sell it to a black couple, the sale would not go through. So all the black people had to live in that neighborhood, right next to where the Fagansons were making pop. Um, that's going to become important in a little while later. This is, another, this is another picture from the book, um, another Fago truck. So I want you to pay attention from here to there. And then in 1920, way over here, one street back and two blocks over, they stayed there till 1935. And maybe we'll go back and look at that picture again now. And I want you to hold on to this. 1935, something happens that makes them move thousands of feet away to Gratiot, and that's where they are today. So since 1905, 1907 if you want, the Fagansons or Fago has been right in this very small area of Detroit. To me, the Fago story is one of loyalty. Loyalty to the neighborhood, and loyalty of the neighborhood and the people in it to Fago. I think both of those things have happened. So let's take a quick look back, because I don't want to lose it. For, now it's called Fago completely. 
Um, gosh, I like the way that guy is dressed. He looks like he's ready for work. Uh, you might notice that there, there seems to be a, a white supervisor and a couple of black guys handling the, the heavy cases. And this is how they did the job, getting the pop ready to go out. These are 12 one-quart bottles to a case. I don't know the flavor. And um, right over here, that's a high-low. They're kind of mechanized now. They can stack that up. They got one, two, three, four, five on that skid. And they're going to stack that up, about three of those high. So they'll have about 15 cases high in their warehouse. So having African-American workers in the factory was not unusual because that's who was in one of the nearest neighborhoods. That happened a lot. So let me catch us back to here. Who's that? Susie. We're in the grape section of the book. After Red Pop comes grape. Susie was, uh, uh, she finally, after like six times we met at Starbucks, finally she let me in her house. Um, maybe because I took a female photographer with me who could beat me up. And uh, so she finally trusted us to come over. I said, Susie, we've got all these great stories, but we don't have any pictures because I can't get any pictures from that darn company. And I was still mad at them. But she said, come on over. And she showed me some of the things she had in her house. She had this bottle. What's that bottle called? Seltzer, seltzer. seltzer bottle. Some people call it a siphon. But seltzer bottle is the one I mostly see. And uh, I don't know if it's in here, but it should have a glass tube that runs up the middle of the seltzer bottle into the top. And when you push down on that lever, carbonated water shoots out of that faucet. Now, this is not for pop. This is just for carbonated water. You could use it in mixed drinks, uh, practical jokes, things like that. I like this bottle because it says Fagel and Faginson Brothers on it. Um, this is the, the purple section is all about what is pop. And it's, it's about 90% carbonated water, about 50% sugar, and then what's the other 85%? Flavors, I guess, and fun. That's the recipe for pop right there. Um, you can check my math on that if you don't believe me. Carbonated water is a naturally occurring thing. When we first, we didn't invent it, we discovered it, and then we figured out how to make it. And when people first discovered this bubbling water coming out of the ground, they said, oh my gosh, what is that bubbling water? What, 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 what should we do with it? What should we do with it? And some guy was there and he said, I know. I'm going to sit in it. So he sat in the water. He said, well, how do you feel? He said, I feel healthy. I feel good. I feel tingly all over. So the other guys sat in the water. And they were sitting in the water feeling tingly. And they said, this must be really good for us. It feels pretty healthy. Uh, what else can we do with it? And one guy said, I know. Let's get some clean, this kind of water, and drink it. If it's healthy to sit in, it must be great to drink. So they got some clean water and drank it, and they felt super healthy. So then people started mixing medicine with the healthy, sparkling water that we did figure out how to make ourselves. And so they started selling tonic in carbonated water. And then later on, somebody got the idea that that stuff tasted pretty bad, and they could maybe fix it up a little bit. So it would be, yeah, still medicine, but it would taste better. So then, People started getting carbonated water um, kind of this way. What is that? What? Do you know this guy? <laughs> is he an old boyfriend or something? Why are you calling him a jerk? Sounds like he went out with half the room. Why do we call him a jerk? Because his left hand has got to jerk that thing down to shoot the bubbly water into the glass. Now, some people told me that's a chocolate phosphate. Somebody told me it was an egg cream, which I found out doesn't have any eggs in it, and I feel a lot better about that. I don't know what he's making, but he's making it at a soda fountain. And the soda fountain is located inside what kind of business? <laughs> exactly, a drugstore or a pharmacy. It is no accident. Gosh, where's that soda jerk when I really need him? Tastes just like rock and rye. <coughs> so 
It's not an accident that James Verner, who invented Verner's ginger ale, was a pharmacist. And around the time of the Civil War, he, he went to war and he left some carbonated water, well, some water anyway, and some ginger, and probably a little bit of sugar in a barrel, an oak barrel. And when he came back from the war, he tasted it. He said, this tastes even better than army food. <laughs> and so we wound up with Verner's. It's not accidental that Coca-Cola was invented by a pharmacist, or that Pepsi-Cola was invented by a pharmacist, and that Dr. Pepper was invented by a pharmacist, and Fago was invented by a... <laughs> you guys are quick. I thought I could trick you. So, so we're selling a lot of that stuff. So our main ingredients so far has been carbonated water, and there's kind of the evolution of it. The next big ingredient that I want to talk about is flavor. So um, this can, <laughs> this can tells the story of Fago. It's signed by Mort Faganson, who was president in like 19, this is a can from 1977. How do I know that? Because I can add 1907 and 70, and I get 1977. And he's explaining, Mort is, that our philosophy from the beginning was to serve a lot of different flavors so that people could find a favorite in there. They might find a flavor they love forever, like Red Pop, or they might find one that they never had before, and they're intrigued by it, and they drink it, and it's popular for a couple years, and then we phase it out. So that was their philosophy from the very beginning. Now, I want to, uh, I want to uh, talk about my favorite flavor, because this is my program. <laughs> my favorite flavor is rock and rye. And um, here's a picture of my wife. <laughs> No, 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 this was my wife's. We had that at lunch. It was so beautiful, I took a picture. This is not my wife. I think I just made the same mistake Carl made, didn't I? No, this is not my wife. This is a nice Victorian lady. I can tell by her 12-inch waist. And one thing about Victorian ladies in the 1880s was they did not drink any alcohol. No, no. Now, maybe it was the necklines, I'm not sure, but sometimes a Victorian lady might get a little tickle in her throat, and she would need some tonic, and the tonic that this lady was using was called rye and rock. And so she, she's got a little glass there for the tonic for her medicine. And she might have, you know, 10 or 12 of those on a normal day. Maybe 14 or 18 or 22 on Saturday. And that would take care of her throat. Do you know what rye and rock was made from? I bet you do. It's made from rye whiskey and rock candy sugar. Now, if you don't believe me, you can try this yourself. Rye whiskey is a little bit coarser than whiskey made from corn or barley. If you don't believe me, go to the liquor store, buy a bunch of different kinds of whiskey, take them home, and you can run a test at home. <laughs> and uh, we did this, and we found out that the rye whiskey was a little bit coarser. So what they would do is they would mix it with whorehound or cinnamon or honey or rock candy sugar. And uh, we put a little lime in there. The more we drank it, the smoother it got. <laughs> so rock and rye, the kind that Fago makes, is not, is not uh, alcoholic. I've tried. Six bottles, eight bottles, ten bottles, nothing. It's not alcoholic. But I think during Prohibition especially, when you couldn't get legal booze, if you could get ginger ale, root beer, rock and rye, lime ricky, you felt a little better about things. And it sure made that stuff you were making in the bathtub go down easier if you mixed it with a little bit of rock and rye. Um, I want to show you, I want to show you how Fago makes rock and rye. It's kind of a secret. Want to see? Okay. Let's see. So this guy's kind of famous. Um, he's Harvey Lipsky. And he was hired at Fago to be a chemist. Actually, he was a chemist when they hired him. And he called himself the Master Elixir Mixer. I like that name. 
And an article, yes, in the Toledo Blade, yes, in the Toledo Blade, did a long interview with him. He was a hilarious guy. He had all these funny quotes in the newspaper. And he told this story that one day the old man, by now the old man, uh, Perry, said, oh, man, it is hard, Harvey, for me to climb up on all these tables and chairs and ladders to mix the flavors. I have to show you how to make the rock and rye. And Harvey said, I'm not even a Faganson. He said, yes, but you're known around here as Mr. Fago, our unofficial historian. I want you to make the rock and rye. So, OK. So Perry said, we take two gallons of this. Now, be careful. Write this down. Two, two gallons of this and two cups of that and two tablespoons of this and a pinch of this and a handful of that and a little bit more of this. And you stir it all up, Harvey. And then you take a towel and you flap it over the mixture and you say these words. And Harvey's like, OK. Well, when he got alone with the mix, he said, I'm a chemist. We do not flap towels at things, and we do not say incantations. We don't do voodoo. So he made a batch. He did everything, two gallons of this, two cups. They mixed it all up, and it came out wrong. So he carefully followed the instructions, and he did it again, still leaving off the flapping towel and the magic words, and it was wrong. And he said, I'm not understanding this at all. I followed everything exactly right, except for the flapping towel and the incantation. So he tried it again with the towel and with the incantation. It came out right. He said, I don't know what's going on, but I guess that's the way we have to make the rock and rye. So of course, I spend a lot more time than this on rock and rye in the book. And one of the chapters is colored with rock and rye. Oh, it would have been cool if the flavors could have been like a smell-o-vision. So water, flavor, one more ingredient I want to talk about. It's a very political ingredient. It's the sweetener. It's the sweetener. It might surprise you to learn. I'm saying sweetener. I could just say sugar. But it might surprise you to hear that saccharin was discovered in 1879. I say discovered because it was discovered in the lab where they were trying to do something with a coal tar byproduct. And what happened, the way we usually discover sweeteners is somebody sticks their finger in their mouth. In this case, I think a guy went out to have a cigarette on his break, and he was like, why is my cigarette so sweet? What, what's, oh, that stuff I've been working with. Didn't wash his hands. <laughs> and went in and said, try that stuff. I think it's really sweet. So that's where we got saccharin. The same thing happened later on with cyclamates, and it happened again. We've had three or four big artificial sweeteners, but we really want to focus here on sugar. There's a lot of sweeteners. There's honey, there's corn syrup, uh, but the best sugar for making pop is cane sugar. Not the kind we have in Michigan from Beets, but cane sugar mixes the best. In fact, if you buy those glass bottles now, they'll say on the bottle, cane sugar. In fact, some other companies advertise the cane sugar as well, because that's the Cadillac of sugars. Well, during the Great War, uh, sugar we, we see how political sugar was. If you think about your history, you remember that sugar was part of the triangle trade that brought slaves to the United States. Um, sugar was on those boats when they didn't have people on them. And sugar is what led us to get involved in the politics of so many countries in this hemisphere, uh, where we were concerned about who was governing the countries and where people were working. So that led us into places like Panama and Cuba and Haiti. So during the Great War, the problem was that we were using all these ships to move 400 million pounds of sugar into the United States every year. So the United States Food Administration put out some advice. Some people call it propaganda. Uh, and in this piece of advice, an enormous woman has squashed half of Manhattan. And she's slurping up the Atlantic Ocean. She's got a long straw through this soda fountain glass. And all these ships carrying sugar are being drawn toward her glass and being diverted from carrying soldiers, supplies, and food to Europe, where there's a war going on. And this guy is calling, get that stuff over here. We have a war here. And you're sitting around drinking sugary desserts. Well, we got through all of that. It was, it was, it was not mandatory that you ration but highly encouraged, and people were trying to be patriotic. So they would uh, follow along with the rules and uh, not use as much sugar as they had. Well, 
The war ended, things evened out, and then we get to that troubled year, 1935. 1935 was the year, you might remember, when the Fagansons had to move. Why did they have to move? Remember that neighborhood, Black Bottom? It got stuffed. It was so full that there really there were only two choices, either expand the neighborhood or start to build it taller, start to stack people up, tear down some of the housing in there and build high-rise housing. So which do you think we did? We stuffed more people in there. <laughs> we didn't expand the neighborhood. So the federal government came along. Eleanor Roosevelt was here for the groundbreaking, I think. And we started building the Brewster Housing Project in 1935. And when the federal government looked around, they said, you know, we got to find a place to put this high-rise housing. Ben, Perry, your factory is in our way. So the Fagansons lost their factory for housing in Black Bottom. Or, yeah, part of Black Bottom. So this time Ben came to the rescue said, Perry, I think I found a place. I think I found a place where we can move and build our new factory. And it was this place. This is on Gratiot Avenue, 3579 Gratiot Avenue. If you look up in here, this is why I picked this picture. This was in Susie's house. This says Horse Mart, not Walmart, Horse Mart. Horse Mart was the place in Detroit, kind of like uh, the Eastern Market, but where you went to buy, sell, and trade horses. This used to be all open, and you'd walk right in through this arch with your horses. There'd be a big ring in there, and you could trade horses. It later became a truck factory owned by a company called Gottfriedson, a Canadian company. And then after that, uh, the, uh, the Faganson brothers moved Fago into there. Now, Perry was concerned. He said, Ben, that's way too much factory for us. And Ben said, what choice do we have? It's, it's not far away. It's available. The price is right. We got to move. So they moved in there. Moving into this building put them right in the middle of Pop Alley in Detroit. There were 40 bottlers in this neighborhood. Pop and beer, mostly pop. We had Grilly, we had Atlas, we had Bulldog. Uh, Town Club was around. Werner was not in this neighborhood, they were over on Woodward. But we had a lot of bottlers in this immediate neighborhood. In fact, right over there was the Pepsi factory, and right over here was Coca-Cola. Now, the Pepsi factory was owned by the Dawson family. Have you ever been to the Dawson Great Lakes Museum? Heard of it? Been there? That was built with Pepsi money. And outside of the Dawson Great Lakes Museum is a, like a little house or a little display thing with a boat in it. Did you see that boat ever? What boat is that? Pepsi. It's the Miss Pepsi, and now you know why. That's how they advertised their bottling company by putting a boat on the river. So they moved in there, and pretty soon they were filling it up. They were filling it up, and the factory is soon going to be not big enough for them anymore. And they have an interesting solution for that. But before we get there, we have, now we're numbering our wars. We have World War II. World War II. And this time, the sugar rationing was for real. The first commodity rationed after Pearl Harbor was sugar. And sugar was the last one to be derationed. What else was rationed during World War II? Gasoline. Gasoline. Soap. 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 Yeah. Nylons. Nylons. Tires. tires. Rubber for tires. Tires, yes. Um, my mother complains that shoes were rationed. And her mother would say, oh, you need new shoes, Marty. And so she would take my mom over to Windsor, and the shoes there were not very stylish. And my mother had to go to school in Canadian shoes. <laughs> and the kids would tease her and say, ah, uh -huh, she got her shoes in Canada. It's very hard on my mother. So here we are during the war. I want to give you some coupons for your sugar purchases. Um, you need that with money to buy sugar for yourself. But if you're a big company like Coca-Cola, or a smaller company like Fago, the federal government said you are limited to 80% of the sugar you had before the war. We're cutting everybody 20%. Sanders, Pepsi-Cola, those bakers, all cut down to 80%. 
So everybody, I think, followed it. It was the law. You could get in a lot of trouble if you used too much sugar. Coca-Cola was a very loyal company. Now, they had been saying since before Fago was around that Coca-Cola was a very refreshing beverage. They even said this after they took the cocaine out of it. They said, this is a very refreshing beverage, and our soldiers, of all people, need refreshment, right? Yeah, what are they doing? They're breathing smoke. They're sleeping in dirt. People are trying to kill them. They have to kill other people. Or maybe it's just super boring. They need to be refreshed. So Coca-Cola said, we want to we wanna provide as much Coca-Cola for our troops as they need, no matter what the cost is. But we're going to follow the 80% rule here, just like everybody else. Well, Coca-Cola was so generous, so generous, that they, they loaned one of their own executives at no cost to the federal government to sit on the sugar rationing board. They gave for the country. So when the sugar rationing board sat around trying to figure out what to do about the sugar problem, there was somebody from Coca-Cola, a professional there, to give them advice. And the advice went something like this. We're going to stick with the 80% limit, but we've got to figure out a way to refresh those troops. And we will if we can get a little more sugar. So the sugar rationing board, with Coca-Cola helping, decided that Coca-Cola would be limited to 80% except when they were making Coca-Cola for soldiers. Then they could have as much as they needed on one condition. Coca-Cola must build 10 plants around the world to supply that pop to the troops. So these guys are in Italy. This is, this is private first class Norman Taylor, his first Coke in more than a year, probably bottled in Europe. And so during the war, Coca-Cola became very popular with all these soldiers who were soon back in the United States looking around for a job in a Coke. So that's how we handled the sugar problem during World War II. Now, I don't want you to think the Fagansons weren't doing anything during the war. The Fagansons gave three very important assets to the war effort. Here they are. So here's Perry. Hey, what do you notice about Perry? <laughs> He's smiling. <laughs> He's smiling because Fago is now 40 years old, it's 1947, and his son, Mort, and Herman have come back from the war. Ben passed away in the 40s. His son, Phil, also went to the war. He's back, and Perry is ready to turn the company over to a whole new generation. And we can have a whole new Fago with new people, and here they are. So, of course, he's happy. He can finally get some rest, except for one thing. Perry never stopped coming to work. Here he is, driving to work in a steam shovel. <laughs> Not really. You don't wear a suit to drive a steam shovel. The hat, maybe. Uh, what's going on is he's posing for a publicity shot. They are using the steam shovel to connect the Fago factories to some of the factories around them in Pop Alley, because some of their competitors are going out of business. But not Fago. So the way it worked was, I want to go back to that picture because I think it's kind of telling. This is the old man. These are his two sons on either side of him. That's his nephew over off to the side, a little bit shorter. Um, it, it was pretty harmonious. Mort and Phil worked inside the factory all the time together. Herman did the books. He worked outside of the factory, handling all the finances. But Mort and Phil were together all the time, and they were in their factory with, with Papa there, Papa and Uncle. Um, here they are on the orange line. You thought that was in New York, right? Um, and so that's Mort in the back, and that's Phil with the nice sideburns in the foreground. Mort was Mr. Hollywood, Mr. Personality. He was the one to talk to the media, explain what everything was as, um, as they came up with new ideas, new flavors. Phil worked on the inside. Susie, oh, I love talking to Susie. She loved her father so much. Um, and I got to talk to her a bunch of times. Uh, once I said, Susie, when did your father come home from work? She said, oh, well, my father always tried to be home for dinner unless there was a storm. Then he would be um, making sure the trucks and the men got back OK. And uh, she said that factory was his baby. He had to put it to bed at night. He was on the loading dock. 
he was in the mixing room, he was in the warehouse, he went all around the place all the time. I said, what did you do when your father came home? She said, oh, I loved him. I would run to my dad and I would hug him and I would, you know, nuzzle his shirt and I would say, Daddy, it's a red pop day. <laughs> and he'd say, that's right, Susie, we made red pop today. I said, did you ever have Fago at dinner? She said, not usually, but sometimes. She said, once we were having Fago at dinner and I was stirring the Fago with my spoon like this. And my father said, Susie, what are you doing? She said, I'm stirring out the bubbles. He said, Susie, what do you think I do all day? I spent all day putting those bubbles in there. She said, I wanted to cry. I never did it in front of him again. Funny thing, Susie went to uh, Werner Elementary. <laughs> she did. She said, every year at Christmas, they would send over candy canes and Werners. She said, I felt like a traitor. But I like that Werners. <laughs> Let's go inside the rest. Now, they're, the, right now, they're in that 1935 and on factory, the one they still use today. Here's inside the factory. Um, a lot like the other picture. Um, black people and white people working together. Uh, 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 Mort wrote about that in the company newsletter once, that he liked seeing men work together. Um, when I was talking to Susie, I said, did you, ever, did you ever work at your father and your uncle's factory? She said, yes, I, was a, I worked there one summer. I said, what summer was that? She said, 1967. Ooh, what happened in 1967? That's right. So I said, what was that like? She said, well, we didn't go to work on Monday. My father had gotten my brother's baseball bat and crossbow to defend the family in case we needed to. Fortunately, he didn't have to get after anybody with the crossbow. But maybe not Monday, but maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, she said they drove down Gratiot toward the factory, and there are big National Guard armored vehicles along Gratiot. It looks like there's a war going on. And that store has been broken into and that store is burned, and that store is completely gone, what is the factory going to look like when we get there? Well, they got in, and she said, not one window was broken. She said, wow, how, how, did, how did this happen? And her father and her uncle sat, worked at two big wooden desks, pushed right up next to each other, and talked across the desks all the time. And she went to her father's desk and picked up a piece of paper and it said green $25, Jones $20, Jackson $25. Bet you thought I was going to say 20, right? And she said, I think my uncle and my dad are loaning people in the neighborhood money. I think they're being good guys and so the neighborhood was nice to them. I don't think that's it. That was in July. In April, I almost found an article about Fago, but you can't find the article anymore because the microfilm is not in the Burton Historical Collections and it's not at the State Library. And the Michigan Chronicle, the black newspaper in Detroit, doesn't have a copy of what it did that April. But some librarian wrote on a card what was in the article, and the article said that the, it was about hiring practices at Fago. 60% of the male workers and 70% of the production workers at Fago were black. I think they didn't bother the factory because they worked there. And Mr. Rock and Rye, Harvey Lipsky, he said, that Monday, 97% of our workers came to work. We had to tell them to go home. We said, you can't work today. It's too dangerous. Carefully go home. We'll call you when it's OK to work. So I think that's what really happened. Um, I want to move to the next chapter. It's about advertising, okay? It's about advertising. And it's the Arctic Sun chapter. Um, when I finally got in Susie's house, we looked all around, and I already knew the story about this before I saw it. This is her father's nameplate. He was a very simple guy. He didn't need a big star on the door. He just had a simple nameplate on his desk and a pen set that was given to him by a truck company. Now, as time went by, Fago moved from store deliveries, they call those uh, uh, store door delivery, that's what they called it, to those little stores. 
they stopped doing that because they found it was much more efficient to take a lot of pop to Great Scott's warehouse and have Great Scott deliver all that pop with its usual mixed delivery. So they had to buy these kinds of trucks. And uh, Harvey Lipsky told Susie that this was Phil's idea. He said, we need some of these big trucks. Um, when you make our trucks, paint them one color on one side and one color, a different color on the other side. I said, okay. So now when people are walking down Gratiot, they go, ooh, wow. There goes a new red Fago truck. Wow, must be expensive. Whoa, they have a blue one too. They must have spent a lot of money on these trucks. So this was in a curio cabinet inside her house, so I could see both sides of the truck. And we move things around a little bit so that you can see them too. Um, they were always looking for little advantages. Uh, when I used to work at the Free Press, if I went into a drugstore and there was a stack of Free Presses here and a stack of newses there, I would pick up a five or six Free Presses, look at them, put them down. <laughs> <laughs> they would do the same thing in the Faginson family. They would reorder all the shelves in the store while somebody distracted the shopkeeper. Um, this is the way you're supposed to advertise. Now this picture comes from a guy, his name is, I told you it was hard to get pictures because Fago was not cooperative. Um, the guy who took this picture goes by the name of Nailhead. So I saw that picture online and I wrote to him, I said, Dear Mr. Nailhead, um, uh, what's going on in this picture? Uh, it looks kind of interesting. I'd like to use it in the Fago book. I, I'll send you a free copy. And he said, OK. He said, here's what's going on. This is an advertising mural. And what's happening is you pay the store owner to paint your billboard on the side of the store. And that's all good until the store owner says, we need some windows over here and maybe a blower fan over there, well, then you're just kind of, unless you send a painter out to fix that up, you're kind of stuck that way. So Nailhead is driving uh, around the city. He doesn't like to drive in the freeway ditches because you can get in a traffic jam down there. So he stays on the surface streets and he sees these guys here with the ladders and they are stripping the siding off this building, revealing a sign he's never seen before, this mural. So Mr. Nailhead stops, takes a couple pictures that he let me use goes on his way, he comes back the next day, the mural is gone again because new siding is up. So this is a ghost sign. I, put a, I love those ghost signs. I put a few in the book. This one is um, maybe the most famous ghost sign. This is a picture by a guy named James C. Ritchie. And this nice Fago orange mural was on the side of a building. And then somebody built a store right up against it and covered it up. Fortunately, the new store caught fire and was destroyed. <laughs> and it was so badly damaged, they had to tear the wall down. You see a little bit of it over there. And so then people say, oh, Fago, I remember Fago. Fago Orange, my favorite. And it stayed like this for about 14 months until some knucklehead with an oversupply of black paint came and destroyed the mural. Yes, he did. Um, not before James C. Ritchie and other people got some pictures, but the mural was and is gone. Fago responded this way. Ah. So they had, um, this is the Golden Sign Company. Her name is Golden. They met as students at the University of Michigan, and they're painting that mural on the side of the Fago building, about 15 feet up in the air, behind a fence over the Fago parking lot. I don't know what's going on back there. So um, I think that sign should be safe for a little while. Anyway, uh, in 1935, the year uh, the Fagansons moved into Pop Alley, they hired a little Southfield advertising company called Donor. Heard of it? This was a very good thing for Donor and for Fago. It was a $2,000 contract, but Donor started bringing some professionalism to Fago advertising. And began with some billboards. I love this one because I'm an old headline writer. And that's an enormous bottle of, I think it says strawberry. Um, but the other thing that they did that was really kind of cool was they started going into television. 
And one of the commercials from the 50s, hard to find, come on. We have a plan B. Oh, there it is. OK, I was just a little impatient. So this is an artist's rendering. This is not from a commercial. This is an artist's rendering of a pushcart man selling black cherry. I don't think that ever really happened. But uh, in fact, the commercial had characters in it that look more like the characters on this pop can here. Um, they're drawn this way. And interesting that a commercial in the 1950s was also replicated on the cans, which were also a new thing in the 1950s. And the way the story goes, the children are playing. There's a, a very nice bluesy kind of soundtrack in this commercial. I put 25 links in the book to different commercials and videos, because I think that's a good way to absorb the story. And they're all still out there. And so they hear the pushcart man saying, Fago Black Cherry. Come get your black cherry. And they get like, it's like the ice cream man time, right? So they scrabble around, and the boys come up with some coins. And they run over to the pushcart man, and the boys give him the coins. And he pours some black cherry into this cup that this boy somehow has with him. And uh, the boys drink the black cherry. And then the mean boy pours the last two drops on the ground in front of the girl. And she looks so sad. And the boys run away laughing. And the pushcart man has seen all this, and he flips a coin over the girl's head and she hears it and turns around and picks it up and gives it to the pushcart man and he gives her a whole bottle of black cherry and she goes back over to where those boys are and they're like how did she get all of that so that was a very nice commercial the the, the people who were doing these early commercial animations many of them had worked for disney went on strike got fired were blacklisted during the red scare and they had no work but they did find work in california making animated commercials. And some people say commercials, not just Fago, but other companies as well, kept animators going. And they began to infiltrate Saturday morning cartoons. And now, of course, half the movies we see are animations also. Um, do you know what that's about? I have to check something back here. OK, this is, going to take some, this is going to take some effort. What is that about? Black Bart. Black Bart. Do you know that Susie and her family named their black lab Black Bart? <laughs> Crazy people over there. So let's see what we can do here. Wish me luck. great commercial <laughs> they had some good ones do you remember this one do you remember this guy yeah. who's that who's that guy the great gildersleeve that's right his name was harold perry he's one of the few who made the transition from being a radio star he was on fibber mcgee and molly and he made it over to television and some movies and he was hired as a pitch man for Fago. And Mort, I'm pretty sure it was Mort, maybe this is why I like to call him Hollywood, nobody else does. Uh, Mort was into getting stars to advertise Fago. And 
he had a couple kinds of commercials that were very well known. You might remember when he was a grocer and kids would come in and say, hey, mister, I want a Fago. And he'd say, what flavor do you want? And they'd say, well, what flavors do you got? And he'd go through this long list to show you that Fago has a lot of, and then another kid would come in, hey, mister, I want a Fago. What flavor do you want? Well, what do you got? Again. And then they had to do the diet flavors for a man. Well, another commercial was with this song, Remember When You Were a Kid. It was a very popular song, so popular that when Fago advertised copies of that record for 25 cents, they sold 75,000 records. And it moved up the radio playlist as a hit. Do you remember a commercial where a guy dressed like, well, like this, was leading people in a song? Where was that filmed? The where? No. It was filmed on the Fiesta. There was a Fiesta in Detroit? No. It was filmed off Acapulco. Here's what happened. A donor came in and said, here's an idea, here's a concept. We have the great Gildersleeve lead a bunch of people singing on a boat, singing the Remember When You Were a Kid jingle, and we get everybody singing along with us. They said, well, maybe, maybe, we could do that maybe. Um, we bring it out in the summer, and it'll be the summertime thing. Well, they thought of the idea so late in the year, they said, well, it's fall now, it's winter soon, and in Michigan, winter lasts about 14 months, <laughs> and if we wait until summer and the ice is out of the lakes and the river to make the commercial, it won't be ready for summer. So they decided they had to get the great Gildersleeve out of California onto a boat off Mexico. A guy who came to this talk from Donor said they flew people out and they got on this Mexican tour boat and paddled around and sang the song. And then when they put it on the air, everybody who had Fago in their town thought it was their local boat. In fact, Fago's website had a boat that said Bablo on it with a guy dressed like this on the boat. They don't have that anymore. But that was the great Gildersleeve's um, contribution to Fago lore. Oh, thank you. I hope that doesn't happen again. Um, do you recognize anybody in this commercial? Who? Kermit? Elmo? Who's, go, who's in there? This is a Jim Henson commercial. Jim Henson, yes, he made 10 commercials for Fago. He made 200 commercials for Wilkins Coffee. These were eight second commercials used at station breaks. Eight second story with a two second product shot. And the way it works is this guy over here, this is Wilkins. And that's the name of the coffee company. And Wilkins offers coffee to the other guy. His name is Wontkins. He says, have a nice, delicious cup of Wilkins coffee. And Wilkins says, no, I don't like coffee. So then, something terrible happens to Wilkins. It might be with a cannon, a shotgun, a guillotine, a steamroller. It's always painful and often fatal. And so then people in the late 50s are watching their commercial going, hmm, that's kind of funny, but should I be laughing? Well, they're not really people, it's just a puppet. Uh, in this one, you see Wilkins sitting by the side of his pool saying, I just filled my pool with delicious Fago pop. And then you hear a bunch of splashing and bubbles and water starts shooting up and Wilkins pops up and says, help, help, I'm drowning. And he goes back down again and Wilkins says, <laughs> I told him he'd drink some Fago pop. So that's a, that's a good one and I'd link to that in the book too, of course. Now, the real, the real change uh, that happened to Fago happened because of advertising in 1965. Because in 1965, the Tigers, the Tigers decided they would sell their advertising in a new way. They were going to sell their advertising, not for the whole season, but you could buy just some games. So a, a, a re relatively modest bottler like Fago could afford to be during a televised game. So, now this is not new. Advertising with the Tigers is not new. Uh, this is Ty Cobb, the Georgia Peach, in 
1907, October, the month before Fago started, and he's advertising his hometown Coca-Cola. My guess is that Ty Cobb made a lot more money from Coca-Cola than he ever did from the Tigers. Um, here's a little thing for you souvenir hunters. This is a, a pin from 1965. And uh, so uh, donor came in, told Hollywood Mort, hey, we can get on the televised TV uh, Tiger games. Mort said, let's go for it. Mort came back, a uh, uh, donor came back and said, hey, good news. We're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be all over the place. We're gonna be on TV in Traverse City. We're gonna be on TV in Toledo. We're gonna be all over. And Mort said, that's terrible news. There's no Fago in Toledo. There's no Fago in Traverse City. We're just gonna make people mad. We have to get off the air in those cities. Donor said, it's gonna be very expensive to black out part of the market and what are they going to put there? We have to pay for that time and get a new commercial for them. So what Mort and Phil did was they scurried around. They got $30,000 together. They cranked up the machines and they made extra Fago and delivered it and had it in the stores in Toledo and Traverse City. People saw the commercial. They went to the store. Here was this new Fago. They tried it. We love it. Keep sending it. So now, they're getting the idea, we can be much more than a very local company. We can go big time. We can become regional or even national. And Donor and Mort started cranking out celebrity commercials. Um, whenever I don't wait, I get punished. Okay. So, who's that? Soupy Sales, Soupy Sales, that's right. He advertised for Fago. He said, George Washington may be the father of our country, but Fago is the pop. <laughs> Who is this person? W.C. Fields. Fields. Now, he didn't appear in commercials, but people who did his voice appeared in radio and TV commercials for a new kind of pop. Fago was kind of a pioneer with low-calorie pop. And in this case, they did call Frosh a soda for adults. And the W.C. Fields voice said, anything that's not made for small children can't be all bad. <laughs> um, you might have caught a glimpse of this couple on the Walmart storefront. That is Boston Blackie and his leading lady, Lois Collier, and they're enjoying a nice glass of cocoa cream soda, which I wish I could get. It's one of the discontinued flavors. Uh, they were uh, supported by Fago for about two years in their show. And so there was just a little, you know, reminder brought to you by Fago. Um, do you know who this guy is? Thomas Hearns, the Motor City Hitman, the one punch specialist. And what's he selling? What kind of Fago? Punch. That's right. So now my favorite, now Joan Rivers was in some commercials, Laurel and Hardy imitators were in some commercials. My favorite commercial involved this guy, another athlete. Alex Karras, defensive tackle for the Detroit Lions. Now to be a defensive tackle, you have, it helps to be big and nearsighted. And Alex was both of those things. Uh, the problem with being a defensive tackle is that after you retire, you get bigger, bless you. You get bigger. And he did. So he had kind of a famous diet going on in Detroit where everybody was like concerned about, hey, Alex, how are you doing? You losing weight? And he wasn't. So in this commercial, the camera angle looks down and here's Alex sitting at a round table that's almost covered with a pizza. And the narrator says, Alex, I thought you were trying to watch your weight. He said, oh, I am. Look, Diet Fago Red Pop tastes just like the regular. <laughs> and the narrator says, but Alex, what about the pizza? And Alex says, oh, Fago doesn't make pizza. <laughs> Dumb announcer. So, oh. 
It's time for a pop quiz. <laughs> you didn't think you were getting out of here without one, did you? Okay. Now, the book has six pop quizzes in it. This is part of one of the quizzes, most of one of the quizzes. So I'm going to read you the question. Um, if you do really well on this quiz, you get an F. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Question number one. Which of these was not a Fago flavor? Bright, Tango, Go, Sensation, or 6040? Time's up. 6040? <laughs> it's a flavor. I have a bottle at home right now waiting for me. 6040 is the name of a Fago flavor. Which is not a Fago flavor? Go? That's correct. Go is not a Fago flavor. I made that up. Number two is a toughie. When Fago launched gold ginger ale, it gave away a bar of gold, a golden Cadillac, a gold-plated bottle, or a year's supply of pop. A year's supply of pop. Would have been too easy. That's not it. <laughs> that's not it. A gold bottle would be nice, but that's not it either. A gold Cadillac, so Detroit, but that's not it either. You narrowed it down. <laughs> they gave away a bar of gold. I think it was like, it was from Tapper's Jewelry, so maybe it was like a, a, tie, a tie bar. I don't know. Fago 60-40 is 60% grapefruit. What's the other 40%? I'll give you choices. Cherry. You're saying no already. You don't know the other flavors. <laughs> Lime. Pineapple. Or ginger. Lime is the correct answer. You guys are smart. I love you. In a 1984 company newsletter, Fago asked employees to identify its top 10 flavors which of these did not, did not make the list? Not a top 10 selling flavor in 1984. The one we want is the one not in the list. Red Pop, Root Beer, Rock and Rye, Grape, or Punch? Punch. Punch was on the list. One of the originals is still a top 10 flavor in 1984. Grape is not on the list, which I don't understand. It's a good flavor. But there are so many good flavors, it's hard to be in the top ten. Last question, which of these flavors never existed? Moon Mist Green, Moon Mist Red, Moon Mist Blue, or Moon Mist Orange? Orange is correct. They just relaunched Moon Mist Red. Um, uh, they, they said that a new flavor was coming. It was a, it was a, a a comeback flavor. Another, the, the launch before that was for Arctic Sun, which came out in the 90s, then went away and came. I like Arctic Sun. It reminds me of Squirt. And some people say 6040 reminds them of Squirt. My brother in law says that uh, Arctic Sun reminds him of cleaning fluids. <laughs> so he keeps his under the sink. So, celebrity advertising, people in Toledo want all this Fago now, oh my God. So, Mart, Mort, Mr. Hollywood, has this worried look on his face. And the rest of Detroit is starting to wonder, are we going to lose Fago? Because Mort says, we have six acres for our plant. We have added on these other companies. We need a 30-acre plant to be national. I don't think we can do it in, in Detroit unless we get some land. At one point, the city of Detroit offered them land on, maybe you vacation there or have a cottage there, Zug Island. <laughs> I said, maybe you'd like to make pop on Zug Island. Uh. <clears throat> so, no, Zug Island didn't. So he's looking all around. He's going quiet now. He's not having such a big public persona because he's trying to find a place to build a big Fago plant. And the city is, um, well, they continue to get by with what they have. Here's the red pop mayor. Uh, Coleman Young was on record several times as being a Red Pop lover. There were, once the refrigerator in City Hall had a sign on it that said, if your name is not Coleman Young, this Red Pop is not for you. <laughs> so here they are, Mr. Hollywood, Susie's father, and the bookkeeper. 
breaking ground, not on a new factory, but just to do some more connecting to patch things together, sort of like with scotch tape as they try to stay in business. The city is going nuts. Verner's, with the, with the Verner Gnome on Woodward Avenue, sold 300 jobs out of the city. The world's largest department store closed, later imploded. The Pistons moved to Auburn Hills. The Lions moved to Auburn Hills. Motown moves out of Motown. We even lost the Pickles. Vlasic Pickles moved away. Everybody is saying, what are we doing to keep Fago here? We're going to lose Fago. That'll be our last icon. We still have Sanders, but oh, we're losing so much. And we're losing population. And that's, you know, we lose population. And the other thing that's happening is people are drinking less pop. We've got a real problem here. Um, and in the middle of all this, Mort came to a, a, a surprising solution. Should we stay or should we go? Should we grow? Should we stay what we are? And here he is. Now he looks like, he looks like his father a little bit, smiling again. What he decided in the 70s was that the gas crisis made it dumb to have a business that drives trucks all around the country. He decided we're not going to move. We're going to stay. We're not going to grow. We're going to stay where we are at about this size. And they eventually decided to sell the company. And in 1985, they sold the company to Tree Sweet, which made juices. And Tree Sweet um, soon was declaring bankruptcy and quickly tossed the company off to a new company called the National Beverage Company, which owns it today. They make this. They make Shasta. They make Rip It. So, pop consumption is down. If you're not going to drink Fago, and you're not going to drink this kind of water, they have about 25% of the market, but that's suffering a little bit now too. If you're not going to do those things to help Fago, and I really think you should try to help Fago, there's one thing you can do. One thing you can do to help Fago. I'd like for you to warm up for it. I want you to lean that way. And then lean that way. And then go back that way. OK, you're warmed up now. Let's try to put it all together. Is everybody ready? Come on. That's it together, like follow them, follow them. That's good, that's good. She's doing it. You have a nice voice, sir. How's this section? Oh, he's smiling. That's good with the hands, I like it with the hands. Remember when you were a kid? I do. Nice. I like that. Oh, you guys did a wonderful job. You do remember.